welcome to the Melbourne Brain Centre and to the, this ICT for Life Sciences Forum presentation. My name is Luana Smahill, I'm the Forum Convener and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Uh, as many of you know, you've been to these events before. The ICT for Life Science Forum provides an opportunity for us to hear from leaders uh, from science and technology, particularly those working at the interface between biology, computing, engineering and mathematics and how this multidisciplinary approach is being used to address some of the major challenging health uh, issues. This evening we're fortunate to have someone who's actually uh, been a key player in this uh, endeavour, uh, someone who's been involved in building the first MRI scanner. Professor Roger Ordage did his undergraduate degree in physics at Nottingham University and a PhD in the same institution with the Nobel Prize winner Sir Peter Mansfield. He's worked in industry and as an academic at Nottingham University before becoming a professor at Oakland University, Michigan and then moving to the Department of Medical Physics and Bioengineering at University College London as the Joel Professor of Physics Applied to Medicine. He moved to the University of Melbourne and the Melbourne Brain Imaging Centre in 2011 to become the Director and the Chair in Imaging Science in the Department of Anatomy and Neuroscience. Please join with me in welcoming Professor Roger Ordage. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, the breakdown of this talk will be, I'll give a, a short personal history of MRI, and then I want to concentrate on how MRI works, and then give some examples of imaging small samples in high field magnets, and then go on to human brain studies in high field magnets. So high field is one of the key points of these, these lectures, uh, using MRI at high magnetic fields. And then I'll finish off by talking about perfusion and diffusion. So just a quick uh, picture of my supervisor on the far left, Sir Peter Mansfield, and a few other important people in my life, uh, my daughter Katie, and my current PhD student, who's on the far right, who came to do some of the work that I'm going to show you with on uh, tonight with me a month ago. And uh, Mark Lithgow is my, my daughter's PhD supervisor. Uh, this is a picture of the first MRI scanner uh, built at Nottingham over a, a number of years, but it was completed in the form of a whole body imaging scanner in about 1978. And on the far left, you see the magnet itself. It consists of four hoops of wire and produced the magnetic field of 0.1 Tesla, which corresponds to a um, a signal from hydrogen at 4 megahertz. So this was the first whole body scanner. Uh, Peter Mansfield persuaded Oxford Instruments to make it and it seemed to cost a fortune at the time. I think it cost $50,000 or something. So uh, that was, uh, I felt really privileged to be working with it. So we, um, we made the first scanner and I was instrumental in, in making many of the parts and uh, the government said, well, we're not sure that it's safe. So you can't put anybody in until you prove to us that it's safe. So um, I decided to, to do the seminal uh, imaging experiment and put my hand in. Uh, and this is an image of my hand. And uh, I've boosted up the signal intensity on the image on the right just to show that my little finger's crooked, as it, did, it still is, as shown by the photocopy of my hand on the left. So uh, my little fingers a bit uh, crooked and uh, this was the first uh, proof that you could get reasonable resolution on a whole body scanner. And of course the next question was, well scanning is not just about producing resolution, it's also producing contrast between normal tissue and abnormal tissue. So that was the next question that I, I sought to uh, shed some light on. And the way I did this was to get a a breast following mastectomy, a breast with a breast tumour in. I waited outside the uh, surgical theatre. Uh, the breast was given to me. I ran it back over to the MRI scanner, put it in. And the first scans are shown on the left and right. Left is a proton density image. And the image on the right is, uses T1 contrast. And the image C on the bottom shows the distribution of the tumour from as assessed by histopathology 
uh, all that you can do in such a tough, soft tissue. So this clearly showed for the first time that MRI was um, in, in human tissue was going to actually produce some useful contrast between abnormal and normal tissue. And that happened in about 1978. <clears throat> so then um, I went to a conference in, in 1979 and uh, I said, um, well, I'm working on a technique that's going to be 20,000 times faster than your uh, existing techniques. It had the reaction of rather like saying that you can fly from London to Melbourne in about 4.5 seconds, you know, and so naturally the audience laughed, you know, <laughs> at the time when people were taking five minutes and I was saying that you could do it, get an image in 10 milliseconds, it seemed really fanciful. But in fact, the following year, I turned the theory into practice uh, using this uh, smaller gradient system and uh, just the uh, first example, one of the first examples was uh, imaging a red pepper and it was so good I could even image it in colour as well. <laughs> so, uh, so I impressed everybody with this first image which was obtained in a hundredth of a second, far, far faster than, um, than other people and the uh, the UK patent uh, was Ordage and Mansfield on this technique, and it's called Echoplanar Imaging, EPI. And it's the basis for functional MRI, diffusion-weighted MRI, uh, regional cerebral blood flow measurements. It's basically the technique that underpins a lot of applications that we're doing today. It's a very fast imaging technique. Okay, so now I want to go on to talk about the principles. Now I've established that I know something about it. Um, MRI is based on the principles of nuclear magnetic resonance, but we tend to drop the word nuclear because we don't want to imply that it's a radioactive process. So it's called magnetic resonance imaging. So I'm going to go through those three terms, nuclear magnetic resonance. The first basic principle is the nucleus, and the nucleus of interest is the hydrogen nuclei, which is a proton, and because it has spin, and it's charged, it's got a positive charge, it has a dipole or a north and south magnetic pole. So the spinning hydrogen nucleus acts like a small magnet with a north and south pole. And not surprisingly, when you put that hydrogen nucleus inside another magnetic field, a powerful magnetic field, you align the spins, the nuclei, with the direction of the magnetic field, just as a compass needle aligns with the Earth's magnetic field. And a typical magnet is shown here. It's a superconducting magnet with a north pole at one end and a south pole at the far end, with the magnetic field going down through the hole in the middle. And it contains superconducting wire and is stable as long as you keep it at uh, liquid helium temperatures, four degrees Kelvin, it will stay a magnet forever. So that's the main magnetic field B0. But in order to get a signal from, this, uh, from these nuclei, we have to perturb them away from alignment. And we do that with a perpendicular magnetic field called the B1 field, which is oscillating in time. Now, the frequency of the signal is directly proportional to the size of B0. But B1 must be at the, exactly the same frequency as the signal to work in order to resonate the nuclei away from alignment. And I'm going to show you that in a demonstration on the camera. Here we go. So here's my portable MRI machine. I have a magnet here. My nuclei, nucleus, my hydrogen nuclei is represented by a little bar magnet there. And if you just put it in a magnetic field, it's in alignment. In order to get a signal, what we have to do is apply a second magnetic field to drag it away from alignment, then quickly remove that field. So here's my second magnetic field. I mo remove it quickly. I get an oscillation, and it's that oscillation which is the MRI signal. The MRI signal is picked up in the uh, receiver coil, and uh, all that would be great, apart from the fact that I'm using a static magnetic field to apply my magnetic field at 90 degrees, and this has to be much stronger than the first. And it has to be removed very quickly. Now, it's cost about half a million dollars to generate the main magnetic field, how on earth can I afford to make a second magnetic field even more powerful and remove it quickly? Well, I can't. That would be ridiculous. So we use now the principle of resonance. 
And I've got a resonator here, it's a little magnet on a spring. And the spring means it's oscillating at about two or three times a second. And if I apply this at the wrong frequency, so what I've done is actually I've moved my compass needle close to the main magnet, so it's in a very high field. If I oscillate at the wrong frequency, nothing happens. However, if I choose my frequency, I'm moving the, the compass needle away from the magnet, so it's getting lower in frequency. If I now apply an oscillator of the correct frequency, the spins are perturbed, I get a so-called 90 degree pulse, and I get my signal. Now what's happened is that my oscillator is achieving resonance by putting in um, energy at a constant rate which matches the frequency of the hydrogen nucleus. It's a bit like a mum pushing a swing. If she pushes in synchrony with the swing, the oscillation goes up and up as her energy is always implied in synchrony with the swinging motion of the child. And that's what we call resonance. And that's what you've seen here. A little compass magnet can overcome a much more powerful magnet, magnetic field if it's exactly at the right resonant frequency of the hydrogen nucleus. Now typically, in a typical pulse, this might oscillate about uh, 100,000 times in order to overcome the uh, energy of the main magnetic field and drag the spins away from alignment. But because we're talking about frequencies of 50 to 100 megahertz, you could achieve that in about, about a millisecond. So using a, a magnetic field which is 10 to 100,000 times weaker, but applying it in synchrony or in resonance with the compass needle, you can overcome the effect of the aligning effect of the main magnetic field you get resonance, you get a nice big signal when the spins have been knocked through 90 degrees, and then you can measure your MRI signal. Now, a few other things. The signal depends on the, the strength of the magnetic field. So, if I have a very powerful magnetic field, the frequency is very high. And if I have a low magnetic field, the frequency is very low. The magnetic field is decreasing with distance away from the, uh, the magnet. And this is really the principle of imaging as well. Let's say we have two nuclei at different positions. We hit them both. By measuring the frequency of each of those signals, we can pinpoint where the hydrogen nuclei are along the axis. The one closer to the the one closer to the, uh, in a larger magnetic field has a much higher frequency than the one in a lower magnetic field. And in order to distinguish the two, we apply a magnetic field gradient. That is a, a gradient to the magnetic field in space that is high in one end and low in the other. We apply that along the z-axis, and that separates the position of the signal by analysing the frequency and using a Fourier transform to do that, to, to analyse the frequency we can actually tell where the nuclei are in space. And you can do that in three dimensions. You've got your image. OK. There's a few more things I can show uh, with this uh, demonstration. And the first is, what happens when the spins, after the spins have been perturbed? Well, they've got to relax by a relaxation mechanism, back to alignment with the magnetic field. And two things happen. The first is T1 relaxation, or spin lattice relaxation. After the 90 degree pulse, it takes several seconds for the spins to realign with the main magnetic field. And that's actually what happens in real hydrogen nuclei in the body. It takes several seconds. It's about the same time. It's oscillating at tens of megahertz, but it takes several seconds to align with the magnetic field. Once it's aligned with the magnetic field, you can apply another pulse and get another signal from this, the tissue. You have to wait for the alignment to re reoccur. That's what we call T1 relaxation. There's a second relaxation, which is responsible for the signal Okay, uh, the signal decays away uh, in time, 
I'm talking about the signal, the, the oscillating signal, decays away much quicker than the spins realign with the main magnetic field. That process is given a second relaxation term, and it's called T2 relaxation. It's also called spin-spin relaxation, because what happens is, although the spins start in alignment with each other, they start to exchange energy, because they're at the same frequency, they become co coupled oscillators, and they quickly become anti-aligned with each other. And when you've got trillions of these spins in the tissue, it only takes tens of milliseconds for the spins to exchange energy with each other and get out of alignment. And that's what I'm showing you with two compass needles here. This is the principle of coupled oscillators. So they both get a 90 degree pulse. And then can you see that the energy, you can actually see it being exchanged between the two spins. One slows down and then speeds up. And the other one slows down and speeds up in anti-phase with it. That happening on a, a, a large scale means that the signal doesn't remain in alignment. It actually gets out of alignment very quickly. And that's T2 relaxation. There's another component to T2 relaxation when the spins are at slightly different fields to each other. You can see they may start with a 90 degree pulse, but because they're oscillating at different frequencies, they, they get out of phase. So there's two components to T2 relaxation, the exchange of energy with each other and the fact that they're in different magnetic fields, and only one component of T1 relaxation. And it's those two components that mean that T2 is 50 milliseconds and T1, the realignment, is about a second or two. So that's the two mechanisms, the two things that we can measure. Okay, I think that's all I can show you with my compass needles. So we'll go back on the laptop. So the MRI system has these components, a main magnetic field, a means for applying a much weaker B1 field, can be 10,000 times smaller, and you put the sample in. Uh, the spatial information is applied using a magnetic field gradient, which varies the magnetic field along an axis, and by measuring the frequency of the signal from nuclei at different points along that axis, you can actually get a spatial profile of the hydrogen nucleus along the direction of the applied magnetic field gradient. Okay, so that's the basic principle. That one, Professor Paul Lauterbur, a Nobel Prize. He shared it with my supervisor. Um, and he, he developed this principle of using a gradient, separate the spins in space through separation of their frequencies using a magnetic field gradient. So after the B1 pulse, we have return to alignment in T1 seconds, a loss of the uh, oscillating signal in T2 seconds. T2 is generally five to 10 times shorter. Both vary dramatically between tissue types, and that's why we can get contrast differences between normal and abnormal tissue because the T1s and T2s change in various disease states. So this is the source of that first, well, that second slide when I showed contrast through T1 con contrast between normal and abnormal tissue. So standard image contrast can, be, can depend on the water density, the time taken for realignment, T1, uh, and the, this depends on high frequency motions of molecules inside the tissue. The persistence of the signal following a B1 pulse, which is T2 contrast, uh, that's the persistence of the signal in the first 20 milliseconds, and that depends on high and low frequency motions. And we can also make the image depend on the motion of water. And I'm going to show you diffusion and perfusion. And you can also make it flow sensitive as well. So we're going to come on to that. So this is historic data obtained in the early 90s. And it's just a nice example of uh, how those parameters change uh, in, uh, after stroke, 20, uh, 48 hours after stroke, middle cerebral artery occlusion. Uh, you could do the histology. And if you measured the various parameters, the proton density, T1, T2 map, clearly show the region of the stroke as highlighted in the histo histology. The diffusion is, is low. Diffusion drops very quickly in stroke. Within about five minutes, the diffusion of water changes in brain tissue as the uh, structure of the brain tissues uh, changes through cell swelling. So diffusion imaging is a very sensitive marker for early uh, lack of oxygen in tissue. And the cerebral blood flow map shows the, uh, the reason for the whole 
uh, damage is a lack of blood flow through occlusion of an artery. So a uh, very early example of how those parameters change. So I'm going to now go on to the next part of the talk and talk about small samples in high magnetic fields. Uh, the one I used to work in is the uh, um, 9.4T scanner at University College London. And we have a 4.7T 70 system here, which has some, a rather unique uh, capability I'll talk about later. But high field MRI is ideally suited for small animal imaging because it is non-invasive and therefore allows time course studies to be done. Um, so of course the example I'm going to show you is not of that nature at all. <laughs> it's actually shown in dead tissue. Uh, and uh, the example I'm going to show you is ex in vivo mouse embryos. So mouse embryo is taken out of a mouse, and one application is mouse model phenotyping. Uh, you can basically pack these embryos in a single test tube and uh, uh, scan them overnight in a small RF coil in a high magnetic field and using a long scan time. And doing that, you can get really high resolution. You can get data sets of about 52 microns resolution in an 11 hour scan and this enables you, because you uh, uh, scan maybe 20 or 30 of these embryos in one session, it enables quite a high throughput of, uh, of uh, scanning per session. So this is an example of a sagittal image of uh, a CD1 wild-type embryo. Uh, it's got 52 micron isotropic resolution. We increase the contrast between various organs by soaking it in a contrast agent which is a magnetic liquid that goes in and changes the T1 and T2 contrast of the tissue. If you soak it for about two weeks, you get nice contrast between the various organs. But of course, um, you've, you've scanned quite a few um, embryos per night, so the best thing to do is to put them one on top of the other using computers and produce an atlas. So this is an atlas of six embryos, CD1 mice, produced in a single scan, and it shows the uh, anatomy quite, uh, quite nicely. I'll do it one more time. Uh, about midway through, you see the spinal cord coming through. So this is six of, um, of about 20 em embryos that were in that tube that night. And because they see they're all CD1s, we, we use computers to reformat them, put one on the other. There's a spinal cord coming through. And so a possible application of this, well, in fact, the easiest one to start with is a simple genetic disorder, which we used the, uh, the CHD7 knockout mouse, which is a model of human charge syndrome, uh, which is uh, charge syndrome was named because it's an acronym of unusual congenital features in children, and it's of purely genetic origin, and hence our interest. So it's typically associated with car cardiac abnormalities, uh, inner ear, deafness and balance, balance, eye and genitalia defects. And the CHD7 gene is the chromodomain helicase DNA binding protein 7. So the initial study, uh, which was all done in one night, involved um, uh, anim uh, embryos with CHD++, the, the wild type, have both functioning copies of the gene. The CHD plus minus have one functioning copy of the gene, and the ones with no functioning copies of the gene die at about 12, 12 days of gestation, so we're not included in the study. So the study was all the embryo embryos were imaged together simultaneously in the test tube, in a single overnight scan. So we had 19 embryos, the six in the CD1 strain from which the atlas you've already seen was generated. The CD8, CHD7 had five and, um, and the wild type and the plus minus had eight uh, with one genetic defect. So what you can do, you put all 19 of the embryos together and you produce a map of all 19 and then you, do, you select regions where you can segment out regions, the regions correspond to say the olfactory bulb or you might uh, have the whole body as a, as a region if you want to measure the whole body um, volume. Uh, we are interested in the heart ventricles, you can segment those out and then you look for changes between the groups 
on this atlas. You have your, your common atlas and you, you have an atlas of the um, genetically modified and you look for differences and you display it obviously as, uh, as um, charts. So the whole body volumes on the top left show that the CD1 mouse was uh, generally larger than the CHD7 variety and there was no significant difference in the wild type and the plus minus. But on the propagated whole brain volumes, uh, there was a difference both between the CD1s and the CHD7 wild type and the CHD7 wild type and the CHD7 plus minus, the genetically modified uh, mouse. And that's consistent with the histological evidence of impaired hearing and olfactory abilities. The brain's a bit smaller and we can demonstrate that overnight in a single study between these, uh, with a single test tube full of these embryos. Uh, there wasn't a significant difference between the olfactory bulb volumes between the wild type and the plus minus, unfortunately. But there might have been a trend. So that's just one example of combining together high throughput imaging and image processing to actually analyse the data. Each of those embryos took about two hours to realign one on top of the other. So we scanned for about 11 hours, then had about two days of processing in high-end computers to produce the data and understand it. But then you can ask all the questions you want. So my, the next uh, uh, area is large samples in high field magnets. And uh, I worked on a 4.70 system at UCL. And next year, we're anticipating getting a 70, 7 Tesla uh, system in this building, in the corner of the building, in fact, just over there. So what's the purpose of using higher magnetic fields? They give more signal and can be used to produce better images and more accurate biochemical and physiological information. So there's obviously problems, that, apart from the cost. The cost starts going up dramatically between 1.5, 3T and 7T. The differences are almost a factor of five in cost between a 1.5T and a 7T system. But the signal to noise ratio is terrific. So, so we have to deal with the problems. And there's two sorts of problems. It's the, we get inhomogeneity or non-uniformity in the magnetic field caused by the natural magnetism of different tissues in the body. Some contain more iron than others. There's spaces and tissue with lots of water next to each other, and that generates changes in the magnetic field. And then there's also changes in our exciting magnetic field, the oscillating field, the B1 inhomogeneities. And this is because the head starts to act a bit like a uh, lens and you've got an oscillating field coming in it hits the curved surface of the head and the wave that was a plane wave gets curved and you get a focusing of the radio frequency into the center of the head so the head is acting a bit like a lens and focusing the radio frequencies to produce a hot spot in the middle and if you don't do anything about it these are the type of images you get these were at 4.70 the images are characterized by hot regions in the middle, uh, a loss of uh, uh, signal to noise ratio at the edge, and a loss of uh, um, image contrast as well. The image contrast of these images is really quite poor, and the homogeneity is poor. And so what the imaging scientists do is they try to fix all those problems, and this is the 4.70 with the problems fixed, just showing one example image, uh, and um, to show you how good the resolution is, if you look on the outside, you can see the water inside the, um, um, inside the hair follicles. Uh, the, when the water uh, from the hair follicles this, uh, runs out in the longer hairs, you, you can't see them anymore. But the resolution has, the physicists in my group have actually honed the resolution so that they make sure that all the signal uh, that should be in a certain area is in, the, in that area. We call that the resolution function is, is, is now pinpoint sharp. And we've also corrected the imaging procedure to make a uniform image contrast across the whole slice. So we've gone from these type of images to this. So one of the challenges at 70, which we're going to be facing next year, it's worse. Of, of course, everything gets worse with higher magnetic fields. And this is a 70 image produced in Korea in collaboration with the uh, folks at the University of uh, Melbourne. And you can clearly see the problem at the top of the head. There's a dark region at the top of the brain 
where this field focusing effect is occurring. And so these are the problems that, that are face, we face, but the bonus is that look at the resolution you can get in the ponds and in the cere cerebellum compared with the standard 1.5T, which is on the left. You can get terrific resolution, and therefore if you focus on areas of the brain, you'll get much better resolution in the 7T scanner. So that is what we're spending our money to get uh, to next year to try, and I will obviously try to, to use my knowledge to get uniform, as uniform a coverage of the brain as possible. And just another example from the, uh, um, show the red nucleus, a substantial Niagara. Uh, tissue that contains a high iron content always comes out dark because it causes magnetic susceptibilities that uh, cause the signal to drop out in the image. So high iron content um, tissue, such as the substantia nigra, uh, starts to appear high, uh, dark at, uh, at high magnetic field strengths, but that can also be a source of interest to researchers in movement disorders, for example. So this, is, this could be a major application for high field systems. So I now want to go on to talk about the last couple of areas. Firstly, the MRI of cerebral blood flow. I'll remind uh, those of you that don't know what, what it is, uh, that the, this measures the turnover of water in tissue as a surrogate of the rate of oxygen delivery and waste product removal measured in millilitres per 100 gram tissue per minute. So a good value for this would be 100, 100 millilitres per 100 grams per tissue, a replacement of blood of, of about the same volume as the tissue is healthy per minute. But if that drops to say 20 millilitres per 100 grams per minute, then you get you're likely to, the brain is going to die. It's going to die pretty quickly, actually. Something in, in between, say 50, it might take several months for, for you to be affected. So it's a, an important measure telling you about the health of the brain. And in MRI, we, use the, we rely on the following principle. We rely on the inflow of MR-tagged MR water in cerebral tissue and the resulting change in signal intensity. So what we do is we tag the blood as it's going through the carotid arteries in the neck, we wait a second and we look for the signal change in a higher brain slice caused by that tag, tagged blood perfusing into the area, flowing first and then perfusing into the tissue in the area. So we're tagging the blood and watching for a signal intensity change in the brain later on. And some work we've done, just published this year, at the recent conference in uh, Melbourne, which was attended by about 5,000 people. Um, we did this, uh, we showed the first demonstration of a, a modified Siemens scanner with two coils, which are showed on the top, uh, where we could tag either the left or the right carotid arteries, or both together, so that we can explore the, uh, the blood flow from on one side of the brain or the other. And, uh, um, we also had to make a phantom to show that it worked, and that's a very crude phantom of the human brain uh, blood vessels made on a 3D printer, uh, and you can see that the vessels are getting smaller and smaller as you go up the head. Eventually, the, the resolution of the printer doesn't allow us to produce the, the uh, capillaries that we know are there. But anyway, it was a good test to see if the technique worked. And these are the results. So this is tagging on the left carotid artery. Uh, this shows the... Uh, um, cerebral blood flow in the right images of several sections and if you tag on both carotid arteries left and right that's what you get in the middle you get a symmetric image of the blood flow in the brain and if you only tag on one side say the left side you get only the left uh, side of the brain being fed by the left car carotid artery and the vessels in that vicinity so that's an important quantitative tool and when my um, uh, colleague Adrian Campbell was here, my student. Uh, we also did this in animals on the scanner uh, of the building next door. And uh, the normal blood flow map is shown at the top in red. And after traumatic brain injury, you can clearly see that cerebral blood flow in the left hemisphere is, is severely affected. And in fact, there's also an effect on the right hemisphere as well. And that's expected because the shock wave is caused by a, a blow to the head. The shockwave travels through the brain and bounces off the skull on the other side and it's a common pattern to see that injury on the right side even though 
the main blow occurred on the left side of the brain. So that's uh, cerebral blood flow in rat brain. And <coughs> I want to finish off the talk by talking about uh, diffusion-weighted MRI. And basically, this uh, uh, uses the Einstein equation, which is uh, shown at the top. And uh, 2 times the diffusion coefficient times time is the mean squared displacement, r minus r naught squared. I'm sure you knew all that. Uh, and uh, we explore it using magnetic field gradients. Uh, we can apply the magnetic field gradients along various directions, and then we can explore the diffusion along those directions. So for those of you that are not familiar with Einstein's diffusion equation, I've got another demonstration, uh, for which I need my colleague here. And we'll go back to the document camera. So I'm going to represent water molecules this time, not with compass needles, but with grains of sand. And um, first of all, uh, what happens if you deliver each grain of sand I want you to think of as a water molecule? What ha happens if we deliver all the water molecules at time of zero at a certain point? They'll spread out in a 2D plane, and, you, and the, the amount they spread out will ref be reflected by the diffusion coefficient. Okay. 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 So, there's, what you see here is the distribution of water molecules uh, delivered over a time, and the radius of this Let me take that uh, back into there. The radius of this tells us what the diffusion coefficient. In fact, from the uh, equation I showed you, which was the mean squared uh, displacement, it's actually the radius of this circle that tells you what the diffusion coefficient is. OK? And in fact, if we, uh, if we delivered it from a higher height, this means that there's more energy in the molecules, which reflects a higher temperature, if you like, because what we're talking about, the energy of the water molecules bashing about because of diffusion, is a reflection of the temperature they're at. So if we do it at a higher height, hopefully, yes, well, I'm convinced. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no doubt about that. <laughs> you get a larger diffusion coefficient. <laughs> OK. So what, it, what I would do to analyze this, I would actually unwrap it. So I take the length of that vector, which is my R0 is that position there, R is the position here, and I unwrap it over an angle. Angle goes from 0 to 360 degrees. OK? And so each of these measurements are the measurements of the length of that radius. And because it's completely symmetric, the diffusion coefficient in this case means that the water molecules are free to go in whichever direction they want. And the more thermal energy they have, the further they go, or maybe they'd be smaller, smaller molecules and could diffuse, diffuse, uh, diffuse more quickly. OK, let's go to the next demonstration, now I've convinced you of that. And, oh dear, I think we'll put something underneath it. There you go. Now, what I'm going to represent here is what happens in white matter. And in white matter, the myelin sheaths represent a barrier to diffusion. So water cannot easily get through myelin sheaths. So what happens when we apply our diffusion-weighted experiment to white matter? Okay. Perfect. What you get is a different distribution. If I draw now, what happens? It's not a circle, it's an ellipse. Could, could we um, tip it back, yeah. David? It took a lot of courage for David to help me with this, because it could easily go wrong. <laughs> and we get sand in the machine. <laughs> Albert Einstein used to love playing on the beach, though. So if we actually analyse this uh, um, pattern, 
It represents a circle, which is our DC component, 0 to 360. And on top of that, we get a sine wave, which looks like that. That's what we call a first harmonic. Because it's uh, an ellipse, it consists of, it can be broken down into a circle and an extra bit, the elliptical component, which gives you a sine wave. And it's the presence of that sine wave that we measure by applying the diffusion gradient along these different directions. It's the presence of that sine wave that tells us we have a fiber there with a constricted diffusion along one direction. So in that way, we can tell the direction of the fiber. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So now I'm going to cover the case of crossing fibers because elements of the image might contain fibers that cross at 90 degrees to each other in different directions. And let's see what, um, what this generates. The camera's in the way. We move it carefully and we're fine. There we have the result of um, diffusion at a crossing fibre. And you can easily see that it looks something like, like that. I don't, I don't think that's a stretch of the imagination. So if we de deconvolve, oh yeah, take, take it away. Thanks, David. Okay. So, so if we... Uh, Deconvolve that, you've got a circular bit here, which is our basic D, D, DC, and then you've got a set two, two um, oscillations, which is the second harmonic. So a second harmonic tells you that you have two crossing fibers. And in three dimensions, you can even detect the presence of the fibers going in along the third direction. So how can we use this information? we can actually produce wiring diagrams of the brain using diffusion gradients. So looking at the uh, uh, Einstein equation again, uh, the r minus r naught squared is the diameter of that, uh, of, of that circle. Uh, the diffusion coefficient tells you how big the circle is. And if you increase the time, in order to keep pouring sand on, the distribution would get bigger and bigger, but the diffusion coefficient would remain the same. Um, we measure that distance using two magnetic field gradients, which are quite powerful. One applied like this, followed by like that. Because diffusion involves the motion of water as a function of time, the phase accumulated in the first part is not undone in the second, and we get a signal which depends on the diffusion coefficient. More importantly, how do we actually use that information? Well, if the fiber orientations look like that, they might be of different size, but the fibre orientation distribution will go along the fibres because the diffusion coefficient is p powerful or strong along the fibres but weak across the fibres. So for every point in the image, we can generate a map like this, which is, uh, which is a uh, coronal section of a mouse brain with the fibre orientation distributions shown. Uh, I think uh, blue is up and down red is left and right and green is in and out it's a bit difficult to see but what you can actually do now since you know that the fibers are there and their orientation you can start to join them up and produce fiber tracks so this is a fiber track image of a mouse brain and uh, it shows the fibers running from uh, along the corpus callosum for example in red left and right is red uh, up and down is blue, and in and out is green. And this is one section through a three-dimensional map of the mouse brain that we can obtain in the scanner in the basement of the Flory using diffusion-weighted imaging. And if we actually um, now show that as a movie, as you're moving through the brain, So sit, clearly see the fibre tracks, you're going to come out towards the eyes later on. 
Here we go along with there. There's the eyes coming there. So it's a 3D image of the fibre tracks in a mouse brain or a wiring diagram in the brain. Transverse sections look equally good. A bit faster, the eyes at the top. And now we can go one step further. Well, uh, you can do this in human brain, and I'd like to say uh, a lot of thanks for Donald Tourney, Alan Connolly, Fernando Calamante from Aus Austin Hospital that have developed this software to do this and work in junction, uh, conjunction with us to produce the mouse data, but they're also doing this in human data, uh, human brain as well, and it's all looking very promising. I'll just uh, recap, we can use diffusion-weighted imaging from which we can do fibre tracking, as shown in these images, and the next step is to produce maps of the apparent fibre density. So the colour and the intensity now shows the density of tracks, whereas the tractography just showed the tracks. This is now the density passing through each element of the image in three dimensions, where red is again left and right, uh, green is in and out, and so that's a dense fibre density map of the brain. That's it, the apparent fibre density in its coronal section, so in the corpus callosum at the top in red. Um, why is this data so good? It's because our machine in the Flory has been um, installed with this cryoprobe, which is cooled to 30 degrees Kelvin, and with a preamplifier cooled to 77 degrees, and this increases the sensitivity of the signal by about a factor of three. So even though it's only a 4.7 T magnet, it's equivalent to a top of the range 15 Tesla magnets. And there's other good technical reasons why working at low field also gives you an improvement in resolution and a, a more, more importantly, a, a, a benefit in terms of a lack of uh, uh, distortion of the images. So, in conclusions, I've shown you that high quality, high field MRI is valuable for imaging of humans, animal models, and sample specimens. The non-invasive nature of MRI allows serial studies of disease in the same subjects. Advances in image processing allow the combination of high throughput imaging with high throughput analysis. And multiple contrast mechanisms and contrast agents enable a broad use of MRI for studies of disease. And I'd like to finish by thanking my colleagues, uh, both at the Flory, uh, David Wright and Alan Connolly, University of Melbourne, Lee Johnston and Steve Petru, and University College London, where I moved from uh, nine months ago. Um, my students there, Adrian Campbell, John Cleary, and Aaron Oliver Taylor, and the postdocs. Thank you very much. And I guess in closing, I need to thank uh, and must thank our sponsors who make uh, this event possible. The uh, Phillips Orman Fitzpatrick, IBM, uh, the Melbourne School of Engineering, uh, Monash University, uh, the Centre for Neural Engineering at the University of Melbourne, the Bionics Institute, uh, the uh, Victorian Life Science Computation Initiative, uh, RMIT University, uh, the Melbourne Convention and Business Bureau, the Bio21 Cluster, NICTA, St Vincent's Hospital, uh, Melbourne Health. It's not every day that we have a pioneer in the field to, uh, to present to us uh, uh, at the forum and uh, we've been very privileged, privileged Roger, to, uh, uh, to have you come and present uh, to us this evening. Um, and I guess uh, Melbourne's all the better for having Roger here now and hopefully he and his colleagues will do some wonderful things in science. Would you please join with me in thanking uh, Roger for his presentation again? Thank you.